Talmud Yushalmi explains that there are two verses in the Torah, two psukim, that describe the shofar with respect to Rosh Hashanah. One is Yom Trua. Rosh Hashanah is a day of Trua, shofar blast. And the other pasuk says Zichron Trua, remembrance of the shofar blast. So Yerushalmi says the two verses describe two realities. Yom Trua, the day of the shofar blast, describes when Rosh Hashanah comes out on the whole. And Zichron Trua, a remembrance of the shofar blast, is the pasuk that describes what happens when Rosh Hashanah comes out on Shabbos and you don't blow the shofar. According to the Yerushalmi, there's no mitzvah of the Torah to blow the shofar when Rosh Hashanah comes out on Shabbos. There is no such mitzvah. <clears throat> to Psukim describe the two realities. The Babli disagrees. The Babli says the reason we don't blow shofar Rosh Hashanah is a protective, I'm sorry, Rosh Hashanah comes out on Shabbos, is a protective against inadvertently violating Shabbos. Blowing the shofar is not simple, it's complicated. There are various nuances that have to be carefully watched. The Chazal were worried that a person, in his zeal to do the mitzvah of shofar correctly, will forget that it's Shabbos, take his instrument and go to an expert, and then the expert will judge whether he blows it correctly or not, and will inadvertently violate Shabbos. So, the Bavli is not agreeing with the Yerushalmi to split up the verses that way. That one verse, Yom Tshua describes Rosh Hashanah on the whole, and Zichor Tshua describes Rosh Hashanah on Shabbos. And Bavli doesn't agree to that. So what does the Bavli hold about the two verses? What are they? When do they apply? al Korcheno, we have to say, <clears throat> that according to the Bavli, both verses apply all the time. Which means on every Rosh Hashanah, whether we blow the shofar or not, the Torah tells us two things. It tells us to say Yom Trua, a day of blowing the shofar, and it's also a day of Zichlon Trua, a remembrance of the shofar. Now what does the title remembrance of the shofar add to the fact that we're blowing the shofar. Zichron Trua. I think what it means is this, that when you blow the shofar, you cause a remembrance. Remembrance of the shofar in English is ambiguous, beautifully ambiguous. It means either you remember the shofar or it means the shofar causes you to remember something else. Remembrance of the shofar could be read either way. And I think what it means is that when you blow the shofar, you cause a remembrance. Every time you blow, according to the Bavli, before the uh, restriction on Shabbos was made, you blow on Shabbos also. And every blowing of a shofar on Rosh Hashanah causes a remembrance. Okay, who's remembering what? Remembrance. Somebody's remembering something. Who's remembering what? Well, take a look in the uh, Tvila of Musaf, Zichronos, the, the, the section on Zichronos. It's a Kaddish Baruch Hu remembering the great acts of the Ovos Olam, the great leaders of the world, from Noah on down, in particular, finally, Yitzchak, who was willing to die at a Kaddish Baruch Hu's command. And because the Kaddish Baruch Hu is remembering all of the great things that they did, he therefore thinks of us in terms of mercy. That means that our blowing the shofar causes that divine memory, so to speak, that divine remembrance, and then the result is that Gosh Baruch Hu showers us with mercy. That's Rosh Hashanah. Now where are we sitting? We're sitting on Sukkot. What is the verse that talks about Sukkot as a time of remembering? Both 
You're sitting in the sukkah in order that we should remember that HaKadosh Baruch who caused us to dwell in sukkos when he took us out of Egypt. What sukkos are those? What sukkos are we remembering from the time that we took the trek through the wilderness? So as Machleik is in the Gemara, two Tanoim, one says, we dwelt in huts. We lived in huts. They had portable or rebuilt huts where they went from place to place. Makeshift walls, thatched roofs. That's one. The other one says, of course we lived in those huts, that's true. We did build those walls, we did have those thatched roofs. But we were also in, 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 we were covered by, enclosed within the clouds of glory. And that's the sukkos that um, the verse is telling us to remember. That of course, who gave us those clouds of glory. Very interesting, in the Shulchan Aruch, there is a simon which says, the clouds, the sukkos that we are to remember on this holiday are the clouds of glory. The Shulchan Aruch is telling us which one of the Tanoim was accepted the halacha. So the commentators ask, okay, that's the symbolism. And the, why is Shulchan Aruch telling me what the symbolism is? Shulchan Aruch isn't the book of symbols. It's a book of actions, requirements, responsibilities. So some say it means to tell you what kavana, what you should have in mind when you sit in the sukkah. Not often does the so, Shulchan Aruch do that, but in this case it did. So we sit in the sukkah and we have in mind the clouds of glory that God gave us. We are, are coming at the end of this period to our remembrance. Now let's put the two things together. We blow the shofar. We, our blowing the shofar causes a Kodesh Baruch Hu Kibiyachal to remember. And that memory gives us mercy. We come to sukkahs and we dwell in the sukkah to remember that mercy that he showered upon us by giving us the clouds of glory. And it's now our memory. So it's a cycle. We perform an action to cause his memory. His memory causes him to shower us with his mercy, which causes our continuing memory. It's a cycle. And it's what's called in the technical literature, Isus de la Sata. It starts with us. We perform the first action. The chain of consequences starts with us. Not always is it that way in an interaction between us and the Kosh Baruch Hu. Not always do we start. But the more fulfilled, the more perfect interaction is one that we start. And here it's our mitzvah, Lord, the shofar, that causes his remembrance, which causes him to shower us with his mercy, which causes us to have a continuing memory of that action. And by the way, when we talk about memory, because we're also remembering, and our actions, so to speak, triggering his memory, you have to know what the word memory means in Hebrew. The word memory in Hebrew, zikaron, does not mean what it means in English. In English, to remember means not to forget. If I tell you to remember, it's because you could forget, and I'm telling you to remember. If I do something to make sure you remember or jog your memory, it's because I'm worried that you're going to forget. It doesn't mean that in Hebrew. And I'll prove it to you. Because in the book of Esther, after they have the great party, the six-month blast, even Los Angeles could learn a lesson from the book of Esther. Right? I don't think they carry on their parties for six months. At the end, Queen Vashti is removed from office because of a certain interaction with the king. Chapter 2 opens where it says, after these things, Achashverosh remembered Vashti, remembered what she had done and what it was decreed against her. Uh Aha. Sometime later he remembered those things. What am I supposed to think? That in between he forgot? Achashverosh is strolling in the palace, says to his aides, you know, I haven't seen Vashti in, in weeks. I wonder where she is. Is she off at Acapulco running up the credit cards? I mean, what happened to her? Oh, slipped my mind. Yes, we pushed her out. We we'd kicked her out of the king. Not likely, right? Surely he remembered. The word liskor in biblical Hebrew often means to take a present action, a present decision and action on the basis of a past fact 
all of a sudden that past fact becomes relevant to a decision now. What Hashverah was initiating is getting a new queen. He wants a new queen. So when we talk about Hashem Baruch remembering, we're not talking about, did he remember, did he look up in his notebooks to make sure that he didn't remember, did he make a, a, a note for himself? Rahman al we're not talking about that. What we mean is, we want those things in the past to become active now in the decision that he's making now. The great righteousness of Noah and of Avram and especially of Yitzchak, of Moshe and all the others, the Nevi'im, we want the Chodesh Baruch Hu to use those facts in the past to determine what he's going to do now. To, to be more of that, to initiate that above, that those facts should be central in the decision how to treat us in the coming year. That's what the Shofar does. Okay, that's the new thought that, that hit me this year I wanted to share with you. Now, there's a famous Midrash, which many people quote and, and discuss, and I think that, like everything in Chazal, we never get to the bottom of it. And there are various elements that are hidden. And different people with different interests, different particular training, will see the different, some of the different elements of what Chazal say. The Medr says, when Hashem went to create the world, it occurred to him, the first thought that, that occurred to him, all of Shavto, is to create the world with the principle of strict justice. All about Olam Bedin. He saw that it wouldn't stand, it would not succeed, and therefore he added the attribute of mercy. Now, this is a very challenging midrash. First of all, taking it literally and simplistically is out of the question. What? Karsh Baruch thought, let's try Din. Let's run a, st- a simulation, get a Cray 62 computer, you know, run a high class simulation. Oh, I see, about uh, 1,600 years later, bang, it's going to crash. Let's try another formula. Let's try strict justice with a little mercy. Put it in. Oh, it's running, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. Terrific. Let's do it that way. That's probably not the right description, right? There's one who doesn't do things that way. But worse than that, if it could be, worse than that is a simple piece of logic. If the thought was to create the world with strict justice, and it's not going to stand, why do anything? Just give up the project. What do you mean? It's not going to work this way, so I'll do it another way. Excuse me. This is what you wanted to do, and it's not going to work. Then don't do anything. Splend the rest of eternity in splendid isolation. Of course, there's no eternity because there's no time, but just don't do anything. From here, you get the key to a, to a particular, uh, particular piece of depth. It can't be that strict justice is the top consideration. If strict justice is the top consideration, if it's the name of the project and it can't succeed, then the project is doomed. Forget it. Give it up. No. Strict justice is a means. It's working on somebody else's behalf. Strict justice is the vice president. Somebody else is the president. And there's somebody else who's the president says, okay, there's a strategy for accomplishing what I want with strict justice. If it's going to lead to a crash, I'll use a different strategy. Who's the president? The president is loving kindness. David Amelech says, Olam Chesed Yibane, the world is created out of loving kindness. That's the name of the project. That's the goal of the project. Loving kindness wants to create a world and promotes strict justice as a way to create that world. And when that world is going to crash, we'll have to define what crash means, then loving kindness says, okay, I'm not going to use that strategy, I'll use a different strategy. We still have to face the false picture of simulating and changing your mind, but at least we know now that it's a two-step process. Above everything is loving kindness. Loving kindness puts strict justice in place, sees a crash, and then changes it. Now let's go step by step. Loving kindness puts strict justice in place. That is really a deep problem. It's a deep problem. Because loving kindness and strict justice contradict one another. How can they be allies if they contradict one another? Let me show you that they contradict one another. Let's say you know someone 
for whom you have very strong feelings. You really love this person. And you want to show this person that you love him or her. How do you show it? Could you show it by, by um, buying something for him at a fair price? He's selling it. You're buying You're paying him money. Paying him money and he's giving you the item at a fair price. Would you show him thereby that you love him? Not at all. Strangers do that. You want to buy something, you pay the price and you get the item. How can you show somebody that you love him only by giving him something that he doesn't deserve, something he hasn't earned, something he has no claim on? You give him a free gift and that way you show him that you love him. So strict justice on the one hand and loving kindness on the other hand are a contradiction in any single interaction with a person that cannot be both. If it's loving kindness, you give him something that he has no right to, no claim on, he hasn't earned it, so it's not justice at all. It's just a free gift. If he's earned it and has a right to it, then it's not loving kindness. How then can it be that loving kindness promotes strict justice as its, its, its deputy to put the project in, in place? The answer is that if you're t- talking about a single interaction, it really is a contradiction. But that's not the only thing to talk about. And I'll tell you, I'll explain to you what I mean. There are many ways to do charity. Maimonides counts eight. Eight different levels of doing charity. The next to highest level is anonymous. The giver and the recipient don't know each other. Why is that a very important element of charity? Because anyone who takes charity feels embarrassed. To take charity means I failed. I couldn't make it on my own. I'm not providing for myself. I'm dependent on someone else's largesse. We want to save the person as much as possible from that embarrassment. So, if he doesn't know who gave it to him, and the one who gave it doesn't know who got it, that way, there's no way for the person to be held to it, but to be put up in his face and have, and have to face this embarrassment of knowing that he failed in that way. That's the next to best. What's the best? The best level of charity, says Maimonides, is to give someone a job. Why? If A gives B a job, B knows it, and A knows it. And anonymity is sacrificed here. They know each other, and still it's better. Why? Because when you get a job and you work and you get paid for your work, there's no embarrassment at all. On the contrary, you feel proud, you feel satisfied, you feel a sense of dignity, of self-worth, you produced for yourself. It's that sense of dignity, that sense of self-worth, that uh, self-esteem that you get from earning it on your own that you promote when you give someone a job. Now let's think, what is a job? What kind of relationship is a job? Well, you sign a contract, Let's say you sign a contract to work 40 hours a week, 48 weeks a year, and you'll be paid $100,000. Doesn't sound too bad, huh? Uh, So now, when you get your paycheck, that's a relationship of dean of strict justice. You sign the contract, you work, you get paid according to the contract. The whole relationship is a relationship of strict justice. But it's a tremendous kindness to give you that relationship to give you that kind of a, of, of, a, of a relationship where you have the opportunity to earn. That's how loving kindness can use strict justice as its means, as its deputy, to accomplish that greatest gift. This is the first thought that the Baruch Hu is expressed as having in this, in this medrash. I want to create the world out of loving kindness. I want to give the best possible gift to the creatures that I will create. Well. I'm going to give them an opportunity to earn the good that they ultimately get because by earning it, that's the best way to give them a complete gift, a gift that comes not only with the item of of gift itself, but also with the sense of dignity, self-respect, self-esteem to the person who earned it for himself. That's the first thought. Now, project that downwards. I'll come back and kill the projection in a minute. I told you I don't believe that. But I'm projecting it downwards. What's going to happen? You're going to hold people strictly. You know, they have time clocks in many, in many jobs. You come in, you swipe your card, it says he came in at 9.16, not 9 o'clock, 9.16. Okay, he's going to lose the first hour. Too bad. 
That's the law. That's the way the contract works. And, you know, we left it to 4.57 instead of 5 o'clock. Knock off a half an hour at the end. He left early. That's how it works. That's how street justice works. When you do that, you have a strict accounting. How many people are going to succeed? Let's say because Baruch Hu creates, and there are thousands, and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions. How many are going to make it? Maybe very few. There'll be a few, but very few. All the rest are going to fail. So then, loving kindness says, that's not satisfactory. It's not satisfactory. The quantity of gift is being collapsed because of the insistence on the quality of the gift. Because I'm setting up a system in which everybody has to earn it by strict rules, very few people are going to get it. I'd rather have a mixed system, a system that runs simultaneously on several different levels. Um, don't know if you've heard of George Soros, poor fellow. I don't mean in dollars, but in culture and in understanding and in spirituality. One has to just dive in that someday he'll be able to graduate to a higher stage of existence. Um, one of the things he does is he bails out bankrupt countries. He has lots of money, and that's a nice thing to do. You know, a country's going bankrupt, so he bails them out. Let's imagine that George Soros is interested in Watts, California. Watts is a terrible, depressed area in, in, Los, in the Los Angeles area. And he wants to help those people. And he says, I heard a lecture by this rabbi. Of course, I don't listen to rabbis. Uh, it's against my principles. But um, I happened to hear this. And he said, the best possible gift is to give a person a job. And Watts, California is terribly depressed economically. I'm setting aside, not for him, you know, uh, one month's spare change is about uh, $250 million. I'm setting aside a few hundred million dollars to set up a job core for Watts, California. Jobs, well-paying, good benefits, nice vacations, you know, and I'm making them available to the people in Watts, California. How much good will that do for Watts, California? Not much because most of the people in Watts, California can't hold jobs. First of all, many are not literate, many have no uh, mathematical skills or even mechanical skills, many have addictions, many have programmed antisocial attitudes, they need rehabilitation. What Soros needs to do is have a mixed strategy, jobs for the 5% who can hold jobs, yes, give them good paying jobs so they'll earn well and they'll have their self-respect and dignity. And for the others, rehabilitation and counseling, physical rehabilitation, psychological rehabilitation. In that way, he can maximize the benefit of the whole population. I think the Kodesh Baruch Hu adopted the same strategy with us. Street justice would give the highest quality gift and for those who will earn it, it's still there. Street justice didn't disappear. Mercy was added. He added mercy as an addition to the, mercy, the, the quality of strict justice. So they work together in tandem. Those who can make it in strict justice will make it and get the highest quality gift. And the rest of us, well, I can't speak for you, but I speak for myself, will we'll get only a mixture of high quality and medium quality and perhaps low quality in order that we should survive to the end and get something. Otherwise, we're going to be lost Entirely. Now, the Midrash is now talking about simulation. The Midrash is telling us that the highest quality gift is the gift of strict justice. That's why he puts it in first. The preference would have been to create a world with strict justice only because if everyone could have succeeded in earning it that way, that would have been the best possible world. But a Kodesh Baruch Hu's desire to maximize the quantity of gift leads him to compromise on the quality of gift. And that's why we live in this two-tiered system. That's what the Midrash is telling us. And that means that when Kosh Baruch deals with the world, we have to realize that he's dealing on, on two broad levels. A level of strict justice and the level for the rest of us with mercy, which is something we didn't strictly earn, but we still get a benefit. You may have heard of the characteristic of Mida Kineged Mida. Uh, someone does something to irritate me, to, to uh, insult me, and uh, 
having grown up as a red-blooded American uh, who had been taught to defend his rights and stand on his honor and so forth and so on, all sorts of reactions are welling up in my blood. But then I've learned a little Torah and I've learned about what the characteristics are of a person who's a Torah Jew, and I think I'm going to let it go. So the Gemara says, if I let go that injury to me, a Kaddish Baruch Hu will pay me back by treating me in the same way. Some of the things that I do are not injurious, but they are breaking his will, breaking his, what, breaking his rules for the, for the world, the rules of my creator. And he has every right to come down hard on me for breaking those rules. But because I don't hold somebody else strictly to the injuries he did to me, Kodesh Baruch Hu will be merciful for me in the, same, in the same way. There's nothing in this about strict justice. There's nothing. It would be as if the guy comes late to work, he switches his life's time card, it's 10.16, he's an hour and a quarter late, and, uh, uh, but someone on the job irritates him, and he passes it off and doesn't show any irritation, so the boss says, okay, I'll pay you for the hour and a quarter that you skipped. Excuse me, being a nice guy and not uh, showing irritation to other people who provoke you doesn't earn you the money of the time that you skipped working. There's no strict justice in that. But Rocha says, yeah, but I'm, I work that way with the world. I work, that's not, that's not strict justice. Mita connected Mita is a kind of mercy because you show that kindness to somebody else. And I want kindness in the world, says Kersh Baruch Hu. I want forgiveness in the world. That being the case, if you show that, I'm going to reward you also by forgiving you that way. There's a sefer called Tomer Devoro, written by a great Kabbalist, and he writes how to put Kabbalistic ideas into practice, what to do in your daily life to live up to these Kabbalistic principles. A wonderful, wonderful sefer. And one of, the, one of the tricks is what I said now, but I'm going to say it in, in more detail. In other words, someone's relating to me in a certain way. I'm interacting with this other person in a certain way. I want to know what I should do. Flip it up one. Put the other person in your place and put yourself in the Kodesh Baruch Hu's place. Now ask yourself. I'm standing next, uh, vis-a-vis a Kodesh Baruch Hu. What do I want from him? This person is taking from me and not paying back. Okay. That's what he's doing. He's taking me, not paying. He's using me. What they say in Hebrew today, he called you a friar. Terrible, terrible piece of, Ameri- of, of, of Israeli slang. A friar is somebody who people take advantage of him and he doesn't get back and he doesn't fight back and take what he, what he, what he deserves, what he could demand. So he's kind of a loser. He's a loser because other people are taking advantage of him. Now I ask myself, Kodesh Baruch Hu gave me the ability to wake up this morning I'm breathing, I'm walking, I'm able to talk. Do I deserve that? What am I asking from Kodesh Baruch Hu? Am I not saying to Kodesh Baruch Hu the same thing that he's saying to me? I'm saying to him, I failed, I didn't do things right, I made mistakes, I'm guilty, I haven't repaired the mistakes that I've made. But anyway, please, please keep me going. Please keep me going. No, if I'm asking Kodesh Baruch Hu for that, somebody else is asking me for that, how can I say no? Kodesh Baruch Hu will say, you're asking me, he asked you, and you said no. So your attitude is no. So I'm using your attitude with respect to you. It's a tremendous, tremendous lever against your natural responses. And think of what you're depending upon from Kodesh Baruch Hu, what you're asking for, and say, if he's asking me for the same thing, if I say no to him, how can I turn around and ask Kodesh Baruch Hu for the same thing? So this is not strict justice. This is the certain characteristics I want in the world, and if you act them out, then I'll support you, even though in strict justice you don't deserve it. Let's take tshuva. Let's take tshuva. Right, right it was before we was talking about tshuva. person does something wrong, and he does tshuva. So what? He did something wrong, and now he's changed his character. He's sorry for what he did, and he'll never do it again, and he confesses it to God. So what? Let's say he killed somebody. That doesn't bring the guy back to life. It doesn't assuage the pain of the, of the relatives who lost, who lost a loved one. So, so why does his doing tshuva free him from all responsibility for what he did? 
It's another meter. Kodesh Baruch Hu says, we do tshuva, I promise you, everything will be set right. You will no longer have any more responsibility. That's not strict justice. These are cases of mercy, of, of, ki- of kindness and forgiveness that Kodesh Baruch Hu practices with us, which aren't on the basis of strict justice. This shows that Kodesh Baruch Hu is running a two-tiered system. For the very greatest, who are held up to an extremely high standard, they're the ones who are, who are, are receiving their gift with strict justice. For the rest of us, we are given opportunities to participate and, be, a, and be, be part of the system and succeed, even if it isn't through strict justice. With this idea, I was able to solve other problems that bothered me for many years. Um, there's a difference between loving kindness and mercy. I've been using both words. Let me now define them carefully. I heard this on a tape from a David Kronglas, who was the Mashkiach in Neri of Baltimore, before I got there in 1969. Um, he said, mercy always is a, is a limitation on justice. Justice says, you did A, you deserve B as a consequence, and mercy says, no, don't do that. Do less, give him more time to repair it, uh, only do half, sometimes skip it altogether. Mercy always says no to justice. If you aren't, if not you, if somebody's on trial in American, in American law, he's accused of a crime, he doesn't introduce a, 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 an appeal for mercy before the verdict is given. Only once he's declared guilty does he ask for mercy. If there's still a chance of him being declared innocent, he doesn't ask for mercy. On the contrary, he wants to be shown to be innocent. If it fails and he's guilty and is supposed to get a certain, a certain sentence, then he can ask for mercy. And there are two very important consequences, says Rabbi Dovah Kronglas. That means that mercy is always an uphill battle. If mercy is saying no to justice, justice says, who are you to say no? Excuse me. Justice is one of a Kodesh Baruch Hu's midos. A Kodesh Baruch Hu wants justice. He believes in justice. So there's always going to be a compromise. At most, mercy can make a compromise with justice. As I'll put it, a midos adin loke. You can't simply wipe off the characteristic of justice. Because who wants that characteristic to work? Secondly, uh, mercy always needs a reason. When someone makes a plea for mercy, he's got to give a reason. Otherwise, justice is justice. You need a reason to limit justice. Loving kindness has neither of those limitations. Loving kindness isn't a reaction to anything else. And loving kindness doesn't need uh, to, to be limited in any way. The world was created out of loving kindness. Olam chesed yibana, as I said before. Loving kindness is an original principle. Mercy is a secondary principle, limiting justice. Okay, having said all of that, there's a name of the Kodesh Baruch Hu, the famous four-letter name, a Yud and a He and a Vav and a He. That name, Sayy Chazal, is associated with the characteristic of mercy. That bothered me for many years. Why should it be characteristic of mercy? It ought to be the characteristic of loving kindness. The Yud and the Hei and the Vav and the Hei, says the Ramban, is the name that describes the Kodesh Baruch Hu as giving existence to the world. Creator. The, the, the root of it, Hove, means to exist. So it describes him as giving existence to the world. If the world is created out of loving kindness, then the right characteristic to associate with that name is loving kindness, not mercy. That led me, over a period of years, to reflect on exactly what mercy is. Let's go through the logic again. You start with loving kindness. Loving kindness says, highest quality gift, let's do it with strict justice. Look down the path, and you see very few people are going to make it. So, someone says, that's not a good outcome, that very few people are going to make it. Let's do it with, with, with mercy. Who's talking? It's loving kindness that's talking. It's the president talking. The vice president is strict justice. The president says, you're too strict. Too few people are going to make it. So I'm going to modify the formula. You're not going to operate on your own, strict justice. Mercy is going to soften, delay, fractionalize the application of strict justice. Who's talking? It's loving kindness talking. 
So mercy is loving kindness over again. It's loving kindness prime. Second time round. And there's a big difference between the two of them. Because the first time, loving kindness is a general principle which sets up a general plan. A plan of strict justice. Second time, loving kindness is interested in the individual. Sure, the best plan is strict justice. But Ruvain isn't going to make it. Ruvain isn't going to make it. I can't tolerate that. I want Ruvain to make it. And Shimon and Levi and Yehuda. I want each one to make it. That's why I think that the second time it's mercy is really an expression of loving kindness. It's a kindness that's based on love. Love for the individual. A commitment to the individual that you should make it. So I think that when Chazal say that the, word, the name is associated with, loving, with, with mercy, they're not skipping loving kindness. It's a particular application of loving kindness. Now, you all know that right after we say the Shema, Hashem Echad, we say you have to. You should love a Kodesh Baruch Hu. What has the oneness of God got to do with loving Him? And if there were three, I couldn't love all three? What has the oneness got to do with it? I think the point is this, the name we're using is the name Yudke Vavke, which is associated with this mercy. This mercy where Kodesh Baruch says, I want you to succeed. And if you can't make it with strict justice, then I'm going to make you succeed by giving you another, another line on which to make it. That's love. That's loving kindness to the individual. That's a commitment to the individual. A person says the Shema and he meditates. Kodesh Baruch creates the world. In particular, he's creating me. And he's creating me out of a commitment that I should succeed. He wants me to succeed. That means he loves me. Then my love is a natural response. Love begets love. When you show love to someone, it's natural for that person to show love back. Otherwise, how do you command love? Love is a feeling. But if you show it, it's natural for it to be reflected back. As Chazal said, when you look at yourself in the water, when you see a reflection... That's what it's like to show love to someone and he shows love back to you. So by saying that a Kodesh Baruch whose name connotes mercy, which means this application of loving kindness that I want you to succeed, we understand why the next verse is that you should love him. Many elements of what we say and what we do can be explained when you take this complex of ideas into account. In davening, we say, Hatov if you don't get the depth of it, it sounds like scratching your right ear with your left hand. Let's see. Tov means chesed. So he's the one of loving kindness because his mercy's never stopped. And he's the merciful one because of the greatest of his loving kindnesses. He's X because of Y and Y because of X. Excuse me? Do it straight. He's X because of X and Y because of Y. No, he's X because of Y and Y because of X. Why do it that way? The answer is that expresses the ideas that I've been telling you. He's a source of loving kindness. You know how far his loving kindness goes? His loving kindness goes so far as to express itself in endless mercy. That's how far the loving kindness goes, the commitment to every individual that he should see. And he's a merciful one. Mercy comes from many different sources. There was a, a, a phrase... I don't know if it's used anymore in politics. You say, oh, the bleeding heart liberal. You know, I see someone in pain. When I think of him in pain, I can't sleep. And I like to sleep. So I'm going to give him money, make sure he's not in pain, so I can sleep better. Right? That's also mercy. But it's mercy that's very self-centered. No, because Baruch's mercy comes from the fact that he built the world out of loving kindness. And it it's, expresses itself in mercy. So then the, the phrases in the, in the davening say explicitly what it is we're talking about. When you analyze how the world works, how the world develops, both in individual lives and also in the lives of the nation and the, and, and the history of the world, you see these principles working their, their ways out in, in, uh, in sometimes separately and sometimes in combination. When... Um, Kodesh Baruch Hu sent Moshe Rabbeinu to Egypt to save the Jewish people. He had a debate, a weeks-long debate at the, at the burning bush. What to do and how to do it. 
And Moshe Rabbeinu raised all sorts of objections against the plan. And goes, well, we answer them one by one. One of the things that Moshe Rabbeinu says is that when I get to Egypt, they're going to ask me what your name is. What should I tell them? So Maimonides in the guide already says, it's very difficult to understand what Moshe Rabbeinu is anticipating. He's going to walk in. He's going to say, I came to save you. In the name of the creator of the universe, he came to save you from Egypt. And they're going to say, what's his name? Why would they do that? What difference could it possibly make? Let's see. Will Moses answer them a name they already know? So they know it. And he knows it. He knows it because they know it. And he knows it. So what? He says the name they don't know. So he'll say, that, they'll say he's lying. It's not his name. What could Moshe Rabbeinu possibly anticipate? They have in mind, they're going to ask me what is his name. So Maimonides has his own explanation and asks for a proof of the existence of the Creator. The Kabbalistic sources have a different answer. Every interaction between the Kodesh Baruch Hu and the world is based on certain principles. Kodesh Baruch Hu doesn't interact with the world out of his infinity. If he did, we'd be lost. We'd be like, uh, one of the philosophers said, if you own a dog, you have a dog at home, I'm not recommending this, but it's an illustration. How a dog, how are your world and his world related? He says they're related like two circles that meet at a single point. How much of your world does he understand? You go off in the morning in the car, you come back in the car, what we're doing the whole time you're out, you give him a bone. That's nice. He likes that bone. He'll get you the paper, you know, and you pat him on his head and he brings you the paper. How much of your world does he understand? If a Kodesh Baruch Hu related to us out of his infinity, we'd be worse off than the dog. We wouldn't understand anything. But Baruch Hu wants us to understand. So therefore, he collapses his interaction down to a tiny, tiny portion, which he created our minds, so as to be able to understand. The people who are asking Moshe Rabbeinu, Kodesh Baruch Hu, you say is going to save us? Under what principle is he going to save us? What principle are we going to understand and how should we deal with it? Here are two possibilities. Is he saving us because the Egyptians are evil and he's punishing them? Is that why he's saving us? Then we don't have to earn it. It's only because their evil is being punished and with their power is broken, we walk free as a benefit. Is he doing it out of mercy for us? Then we might have to earn it. Because mercy doesn't come free. So they're asking, what kind of principle is it that is being used to govern this independence so we'll know how we have to deal with it? And indeed, if you read the principles, what Rosh Baruch tells them, you'll see that different principles will be operating at different times. When they get to the, to the Red Sea, Red Sea, whatever it is, and the Egyptians are bearing down on them, and Moshe Rabbeinu is praying to Kodesh Baruch Hu. And Kodesh Baruch Hu says to him, Matitzakilai, why are you crying out to me? Tabel b'nei Yisrael v'yisol. Tell them to charge into the, into the sea. A lot of pshat, but one pshat is, now is no time to daven. I don't want to hear any prayers now. Because the principle that's governing this interaction, this particular one at the Red Sea, is one that has nothing to do with your earning it. Nothing at all to do with your earning it. I don't want it to be falsified. I don't want it to be misrepresented. Batika Talia. It's my plan for the universe, whether you deserve it or don't deserve it, earn it or don't earn it, not interested. So don't dive and don't make it look as if it's a response to your initiation. It isn't a response to your initiation. So there, Kodesh Baruch Hu is saying, I'm doing this without any strict justice at all. No justice at all. I'm doing this because my, my creation has to develop in this way. And I want it to be visible, because I don't want you to pray. So once you understand this, you understand that the different ways in which a Kodesh Baruch Hu interacts with the world uh, have these two different principles in mind. Now, I'll just tell you one last thing about the general structure of the world. Amchal and Derech Hashem says that our world, we take this for granted, but we shouldn't take it for granted. We live in a world, a physical world, especially a world with free will. That world is finite, it's going to come to an end. After that, there will be what's called Olam Abba, the world to come. And there is the time of eternal reward for the things that we've accomplished in this world. In logic, it doesn't have to be that way. 
Indeed, Maimonides doesn't agree. Maimonides says that our world, our physical world, with birth and death and uh, earning and mitzvot, goes on forever. And there are always new people coming into the world, and new people living and dying, and their souls going to the world to come. Rambam holds that the bodies don't go, only the souls go. And that never stops. The Rambam holds it, then it's a possible position. Says the Ramchal, according to the Kabbalistic tradition, it's not true. It's a possible position, but it's not true. The truth is that our world of deciding, facing challenges, working, earning, will come to an end entirely. And the, because it's all only a means. And Gozra Chachmoso, that usually means the Chachmoso, who did it for a reason that is not obvious to us, that the time of testing should be limited and come to an end, and after which will be. So, the time of testing is a time when street justice is operating. It is operating. It's operating, it's operating with modifications, it's operating together with mercy, but it's operating. Olam Habo is a time when it's not operating at all. And here, there's a secret, which I can't explain to you, just mention it to you, have it in mind, maybe other teachers will, will explain it to you in more detail. If in the world to come, all you get is what you've earned, then that's still justice. That's still justice. You're only getting what you earned. And that's the way it's usually described. But the many sources, certainly capitalistic sources, say that that's only an initial stage in the world to come. The ultimate stage is where the, everyone gets the greatest possible positive reaction, positive reward, positive pleasure, without any regard whatsoever to the levels of service that they performed. Which would mean that you get real chesed. That's real loving kindness. Because as long as it's pegged to how much you earned, it's not really loving kindness, it's really justice. So, that being the case, you see that the two principles aren't equal. For the Rambam, they're both equal and they go on forever, but not according to the Rambam. There comes a time when street justice comes to an end, even in the world to come. And after that, it's only loving kindness. Kodesh Baruch Hu created the world out of loving kindness. Street justice is only a tool whereby that loving kindness can express itself. That's why on Rosh Hashanah, you can ask for mercy. Rosh Hashanah is the day of strict justice, the day of judgment. How can you ask for mercy on the day of judgment? I told you that mercy and strict judgment contradict one another. We should have been told, there's strict judgment, stand there, bow your head, and take it. Take it. Whatever you did, that's what you get, period. What are you asking for mercy for? Because strict justice doesn't exist on its own. It's only the vice president. You can always go over the head of the vice president to the president. You can always do that. He's, a, he's only a representative of something higher. So even in Rosh Hashanah, you can ask for mercy, and we do. What are we reading from the, from the Torah in Rosh Hashanah? The first day we read about the birth of Isaac. Isaac, who's strict justice, being born out of Abraham, who's chesed, who's loving kindness. What do we read on the second day of Rosh Hashanah? When Abraham is told to kill Isaac. It means strict justice, it means, uh, loving kindness doesn't tolerate strict justice anymore. Cuts it off. It doesn't happen in the end, but it could have happened and it will happen. Eventually it will happen. What's Isaac's name in Hebrew? Yitzchak. What does Yitzchak mean? He will laugh. In the future, he will laugh because the strict justice will be turned into kindness. It will no longer operate to set limitations and to punish, but it will be a matter of left. Kosh Baruch Hu should give us the strength to live with the principles that Kosh Baruch Hu runs the world, to organize our lives in such a way as to express them in the best possible way, to bring ourselves as individuals and Kleisra and the world to the time when we can all laugh. Thank you.